Hi, everybody. Welcome to my live today, doing my Q&A about speech and language development and language facilitation. I know it takes a couple minutes for the live to catch up with folks who might be tuning in, so I'm just going to take a moment and introduce myself. My name is Marcy Melzer, and I am an intuitive speech and language pathologist, and I help parents teach their late-talking children how to use the words they need to share their wisdom with the world. And I see that Anna's here. Thanks for joining me, Anna. Um, if you have a question, and you, um, about your child's language development, um, if you're stuck and um, been trying to do some language facilitation at home, or your child has been going to speech therapy and you have questions about that. Um, you might have questions if you're, um, you've been having difficulty with your child being interested in using words, wondering about why that might be and, and what you might be able to do about that. So um, the other thing, while I'm waiting for some, some folks to join me and for some questions to pop up, I wanted to let you know that I'm really excited. After I finish this live, I'm actually going to be jumping on live with a really great gal who I just met online, One, a wonderful thing about the world of Facebook. Um, and she's from Lima, Peru. And she has a group of parents down there, a group of parents of kids who have autism. And they are um, have sent me a whole list, um, 17 or 18 different questions about um, their kids for me to do a live Q&A there. And I thought I could pull up some of those questions while I'm waiting for folks to check out this particular live. I haven't seen anybody join on yet. So let me pull up this other email. There's Lena here. Thank you for joining me, Lena. If you have a question, go ahead and post it there in the comments and I will get to it. Let's see. All right. So um, one of the questions that is coming up that I'm going to be talking about on the other live that came in from a parent in Peru. Um, and this was translated by my new friend, Noile. Noile? Noel, hmm. Noel, I think she goes by Noel. Um, Noelia, Noelia, I'm pretty sure that's it. Sorry if I wrecked your name. <laughs> anyway, so um, she has a friend there in her group who says, at what age do should we do as parents to, what should we do to stimulate their language? Any language, any supplement that helps them and why are there children who have delay in language? And Brianna's here. Hi, Brianna. Thanks for saying hi. Thanks for joining me on the Q&A. I just talked about this question. It's a little bit because it's been translated with the Google Translate. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out exactly what they want. But I think there's a couple different questions in this one. And the first one was, um, what should we do as parents to stimulate language? And the best thing that you can do that I recommend for all my language facilitator parents is that you use um, really basic kind of language to talk about the things that you're doing every day. And um, a big tip is to keep it short. So don't use long phrases um, and, and, and things that you're, um, language that your child will have difficulty imitating. So you should be speaking, if you're doing language facilitation at home, you should be speaking in, two to three word phrases pretty much all the time, if you can, so that your child can start to imitate things that you are saying while you're doing the things that you do in your life. So that's the number one thing that parents can do. And then um, a, a number of the parents who were on this Q&A, this list of questions that I have for the Q&A that I'm doing a little later today, they had some questions about supplements and what supplements you can give to children to help them start to talk better. And that's kind of a whole video in itself, potentially. But sort of my official position, not sort of, but my official position on supplements for using language is that as a speech pathologist, and certainly in the role that I have as a parent consultant, a parent coach. So I coach parents in how to help their kids. 
And if I'm presented um, with a question like this from a parent about what kind of supplement should I give my child, I'm always 100% going to refer them to talk to a professional who knows about biomedical intervention. And, um, you know, I guess the answer to that question is, you know, the, the question wasn't, you know, do I think it helps or whatever. It sort of is what supplements can I give? And, and, and I am not qualified to answer that question. I know that there are a lot of parents that have questions uh, that have, um, you know, interest in being able to give their kids supplements. And I know that there have been a number of parents who have seen new language emergence spontaneously as a result of using biomedical intervention. Biomedical means anything that you're going to do to a physiological body. And sometimes that is supplements. Um, some people use uh, some fish oil kinds of things to help increase the fatty acids that help um, the brain function better. Um, and in the, in the case of all biomedical intervention, my recommendation is that you get some biomedical evaluation before you try any kind of supplements because, first of all, you'll know if they're going to work or not because if you do a biomedical intervention and you, if you without doing the evaluation, you're not going to know what the body is either toxed out by or missing. And um, I certainly can't tell you that by observing your child's behavior, no more than a biomedical practitioner could do that either. So if you are considering biomedical intervention for your child, I highly recommend that you reach out to a practitioner who is skilled in evaluation so that you can get an evaluation of your body for it. So, and I see that Xiao popped on, Xiao, um, who has a question, and she says she wants to be a language facilitator, but if I am always prompting my kid to talk, what will cause him to, will that cause him to resent language? Moreover, if my language facilitation is different from his ABA therapists and school therapy, would those two methods contradict each other? So, what a great question. Um, yeah. So, okay, so it's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, if I'm always prompting my kids to talk, will that cause them to resent language? And first of all, if you want to be a language facilitator, Xiao, the best thing that you can do is never prompt your child to, you, to have to use language. So the way that language facilitation works for the strategies that I recommend for my families is that there is zero pressure no pressure whatsoever to start using words. Um, it's it's more, it, so never do you pull words out of a child or make them say anything or require that they use a word to, um, to get anything. Um, the strategies that we use in language facilitation always have the same four components, easy, happy, safe, and fun. And if they aren't, at least three of those four things because sometimes it isn't very fun but at least it's easy so you know and then that might make you want to try it a little bit more but nowhere in there is any kind of pressure or forcing or anything like that so as far as being a language facilitator um, you know there is none of that involved in fact if you start to feel those emotions where you're having to pull or prompt or force your child to do language, then automatically my number one rule is to stop immediately and make it easier. Um, so I, what I do is I show parents how to never get there. You know, never go there again. We're never forcing language in our household again. So that's the number one thing. And then the other thing is, um, if your language facilitation is different from his ABA therapist and school speech therapy, would those two methods contradict each other? And the, I can't answer that question without knowing exactly what they're doing in the speech therapy and or ABA. And so I do have families who have received speech therapy or have stayed in speech therapy while they are doing language facilitation. 
and they work with their speech therapist. So um, in the one case, they have speech therapy that is free for them. They don't pay for it at all because it's provided by the government. And they do take advantage of that free speech therapy, but they work very closely. The parents work very closely with the speech therapist so that you are using the same kinds of language facilitation strategies. Because after all, I am a speech pathologist. I was a speech therapist for 30 years. The same kinds of techniques that your speech therapist is using with you um, are the kinds of things that can be beneficial to your child. It's just that you need to help make sure that the speech therapist is also using strategies that are easy, happy, safe, and fun. That they're never doing the pushing or forcing or you know expecting you to say something to get something. So that's about speech therapy and school speech therapy traditionally doesn't have that sort of expectation um, um, outside of a highly structured program. So if the speech therapist is using ABA techniques or PECS system techniques or alternative methods to verbal language. So if your speech therapist is, is writing goals for your child to develop use of an alternative system like sign language or pictures, then they aren't doing verbal language facilitation with their therapy time. They're doing what the goals are that they've written on the plan. So if you are working with a therapist, you want to make sure that their goals are the same as your language facilitation goals. And you as a parent are going to have to be the ones to decide what approach is best for your child as far as language emergence, okay? So children who are in ABA therapy who are receiving that therapy to learn other skills, um, academic skills, behavior skills potentially, um, could still benefit from therapy, from ABA services, ABA kind of intervention while you are doing language facilitation. However, if the ABA therapists are facilitating language, they aren't, they are, if they are teaching language skills that are not verbal language, like a PEX or a sign, then that's, then that would be conflicting. And um, the other thing that would be conflicting with language facilitation would be if they are teaching any structured phrases only, like an I want blank or um, a I am blank, like I feel happy, you know, like a fill in the blank or a structured phrase because language facilitation actually works for families who have been in those kinds of interventions and their kids are using those sort of structured phrases kind of for everything. That's what their system is it, because that's what they were taught in ABA therapy. So if your therapist is teaching a system that is not natural verbal language emergence, then that would be conflicting with language facilitation because that's what we work on in language facilitation. And I did have somebody respond to one of the articles that I put out, put out about my secrets revealed. If any of you have seen that blog post uh, go up that ad that, that says um, secrets revealed with me going like this, where I talk about therapy and um, you know, the difference is and things like that. But, but what ha oh, I just lost my train of thought was I was thinking about that. Um, yeah. So if you're, if your child is learning an alternative system to language, facilitation then then that's what they're going to learn so um, then it would be different and and many families who have started waves of communication and working with me have dropped decreased or dropped their ABA therapy um, in lieu of the progress that they're seeing because they may you know in one case I have a family who was in ABA therapy for a year they facilitated language now her son learned a lot of stuff from ABA and he wasn't really even biologically physiologically ready for language facilitation until probably two or three months ago at the earliest he really had some personal healing physiological healing things like that that had to happen and after his body started to heal then 
um, suddenly what they found was the ABA wasn't addressing language facilitation. It was still addressing the things that he needed sort of before his body healed. And he was blowing away all of their, all of their trip, all of their goals. So meeting all of his objectives, all that stuff, faster, faster, faster. And so what happens is um, every family who starts with language facilitation, they get in two weeks, three weeks. If they're in other therapy, the other therapists are saying, wait a minute, what's going on? What's happening? We have to change what we're doing because now your child is suddenly bringing to the therapy skills that are helping us do better with therapy. And so again, when you think about that, what is the purpose then of that therapy if your child is getting better results that he's taking to the therapy session when you're giving him those skills at home? So those are the kinds of questions that you need to ask about the therapy that you are comparing language facilitation to in order to be able to have a, an apples to apples comparison. And the other thing is, as far as speech therapy, even when I worked and did speech therapy in a speech therapy environment, I couldn't get progress faster than I could it, with language facilitation. Every family starts talking the first week. So I hope that that was it. And it says, ABA and Shao says, and Jonathan's here. Thanks for joining Jonathan and Sarah. And Luce is here. Hey, Luce. So Luce is from Peru. She's going to be, hopefully you'll be able to see the recording of the thing that I did before. I want to make sure that I'm not missing anybody. Okay. And then Shao says, ABA helps. Um, eco uh, come on. I'm not sure what you said, E-C-O-L. I think that might be echolalic if you're saying if ABA helps echolalic goals. Bottom line, I can try both ABA and language facilitation both for now. You absolutely can. Like I said, if you, no parent should do any intervention unless you feel 100% that your child's going to benefit from it. And, you know, what's cool about language facilitation is you're never, ever going to be compelled to do something that doesn't sit right with you, that, you know, you feel like is going to work for your child. Otherwise, it's not easy, happy, safe, and fun for you as a language facilitator parent. So let's see. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions popping up. I just wanna make sure it's a little hard to scroll. There we go. Yep, Brianna says make it fun. Most absolutely, that's what we have to do with all of our language facilitation. And Brianna's sort of a sneaky waves of communication mom is she watched every day of my 30 day lives. She took every strategy that I gave and she applied them to her son. And she's seen what, 50 plus more words already? Um, really great. And Claire's here and Claire's also an amazing language facilitator parent getting ready to start your plan. And Shao says she's in. So that's great. And I just talked to another family today from Texas and I'm really hoping that I can get families um, joining me on this waves of communication journey because the thing is when you start to get your kids talking and you're able to explain to your other therapists and you know all the people in your life that it so is possible that it's really really possible that it doesn't take another therapist it just takes you and the right strategies to get to exactly what you need to be doing as far as you know as far as your language facilitation journey and I see Emily just joined. Emily, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the subject. I'm gonna go ahead and answer one more of these. Um, that is, uh, because I've got, so for those of you who just joined me, I'm doing another live that's being translated in Spanish. So I'm gonna be speaking English, Spanglish, because I speak some Spanglish. I speak great Spanglish for a two-year-old child. But, you know, to talk to a whole audience of people and answer questions from moms, I need an interpreter. So I, um, I have been invited by someone who has a group that's in Lima, Peru, and um, she's collected questions from the parents in that group for the Q&A that I'm doing over there. So I'm gonna sort of grab um, one or two of those questions to help share with you because there's some pretty good questions. Um, and here's one that says, all right, so here's a realistic kind of question that I can get. And, and, I, and I'm not gonna be able to talk much with this mom, but it, it's, it's in, interesting information. Um, May, can I also show you their language? Because yes, sorry, Shao, sorry, just got another question from Shao who says, can you show me 
uh, if you know if you're going to work with me in my program, can you show me the goals that they have, and I can you know help put the programs together? Absolutely, that's what I do. In order for you to be the most effective language facilitation parent that you can be, you have to use every resource that you have available. That's why I tell parents, you know, if you have a therapist that's going to work with you for free, and you know, therapists are really smart. And if you can get your therapist to help you start to do some language facilitation um, in the time that they work with them, that's really great because there is such a thing as the mom factor that I did find, you know, that has been something that uh, I've, the reason everything has to be super happy, super fun when I do these is because that was the one thing that I could always bring to the table. Every time I showed up for a therapy session, I was always happy. I was always up. I was always, you know, trying to be Miss Marcy and, and get the kids engaged because I know that they have to be having fun in order to learn. And so what the problem was happening was the parents weren't able to keep that fun level going. And what I've been able to do with the families who are in my program are I've been able to help them use resources to do the skills that they don't innately have. So if you are an introverted, quiet kind of a mom, and maybe your whole family's quiet, you and your partner. Like I have a couple families who are this way. They're both super smart. They spend a lot of time reading and spending time with technology, doing work. They're engineers and you know people who deal with in their head. They're working in their head a lot. They're not out and you know like uh, other families who are um, artists or construction workers or people who build things are are very outward and sometimes very loud. And other families are very quiet and so what I have to do is help those families use resources in your community even if you don't have a family to do things like to get you out of your shell to help make things fun so that you can teach your child how to enjoy and be happy and safe and feel safe in environments that aren't always quiet and calming and predictable like your house so you know that's a really cool thing and hey Christine's just joined and Charmin and Kristen and Ruth and Erica thank you so much for joining me today on this live Q&A um, so I just have been kind of talking to Shao a little bit she's considering the program and I think I've got her tucked into it I'm really glad to see more parents joining all the time I had three new people start this week from three different countries and I'm talking to families all over the US right now who are have had strategy sessions and they're still trying to decide for sure if this is the program for them. And that's why I'm coming here every week doing this live Q&A, talking to people who are not even really sure what language facilitation is and how it works with other therapies or how it might work for you and your family because your family could be, be very different. I've talked to families of multiple kids, families who are only kids, families who see lots of people, families who see no people, you know, all different kinds of things. And the most important thing if you're doing the work is that you use the resources that you have to your best ability. And that includes all the therapies or whatever you that you get. So the good thing about having worked in so many different environments is that I'm able to pull from that. And so Shaw says, haha, my husband and I are both PhDs. Yes. Uh, she's a professor herself. Yes. Uh, used paid speech and ABA through their insurance. Now she's going to look into my contract. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. All right. So um, so here's the question that I wanted to bring up because this is one when I was scrolling through the questions that are coming through for the q and I'm doing later struck me as one that I really wanted to share information about that's very important and so this woman says that her son is three years old and he has been almost two years with language therapy and nothing's happening um, it's more he's drooling too much he just says ah and emits sounds He's trying to imitate. Um, they have done gluten-free, casein-free diets for a year now. And what therapy can she do to make him start to speak? So, um, you know, without being able to, you know, have much details about that, that's the kind of a question I know that people are thinking in their mind. And that's why I want to do this Q&A to be able to come out here because, you know, here's a mom who 
has a child who's been in therapy for a couple years and um, you know, because it's been translated, I'm not so sure if he's only drooling or if drooling is a thing that's going on. Um, and I also don't know what's happening in their speech therapy. So sort of the previous comment that I had about, you know, what's going on about that. But um, the other thing is there are specific criteria for children to be able to have to be successful with language facilitation. And that's why I do a strategy session with every family, a free strategy session where basically it's like it's like a $250 value. It, it, I go through your whole history and figure out, use my intuition, use your history, use your intuition, you know, because I ask parents questions like, why don't you think that your child is talking? Because that information is super valuable. And Instead of going through a checklist and kind of figuring out, is your child doing this or that or this or that, I can have a conversation with families to figure out if your kids really have the whole criteria to be able to do it. And that criteria I've talked about in other videos before, but it basically, if your child is able to use words, say speech sounds, um, even if it's ah, you know, but if a child is making some sounds that have some consonants sometimes or they've said words and they don't say them anymore or they only say them when they're by themselves in their room and you hear them on the baby monitor or, you know, things like that. They may have said words, but they're inconsistent. And remember, with these criteria, this is not that a child prefers to do this. We already know that every late talker does not prefer to use verbal language. We know that going out the going out the door. The point of language facilitation is to find out why. Why aren't they why don't they like it? Why don't they like it? Because when you can figure out why they don't like using language, then you can make it likable by making it fun and and matching the preferences and likes and things that the child has. And so that's really the secret is once you're able to overcome their resistance to wanting to use language, then they're going to be um, then they're going to be really um, then they're going to be really cool. Then they're just then they're going to understand that it works and that's why they do it. And all right. So Christine says, therapist and parent intuition is powerful, and I am 100% positive that Christine uses her intuition and parent intuition in her evaluations because she looks at you from a cellular level. Um, you know, if you, are, if you are looking to get a thorough evaluation, make sure that you take your child to someone who has neurodevelopment experience, who's willing to look at their biology and your history and your emotions, your whole child. And that's what Christine does. And I know absolutely a parent intuition and what you think is going on with your child. Those are really important questions. And, and if you um, are working with a therapist, you need to tell them what's on your mind about your child so that they know how to help you. So that's really important. All right. Claire says, I just read my first action. Oh, language facilitation plan from me, right? I just sent hers out in email this morning. We haven't even had our meeting yet. Uh, I can see why you add the intuitive part. Okay, good. She says, also love that you call parents out on areas they can improve and things that are and won't work. Most of all, you can see how my son learns in a way I couldn't see before, but now it makes perfect sense and I can see what you see. Ah! That's so great. That's like that just made my day. You know, I when I when I write up these language facilitation plans and I take them out to fam you know, I send them out to families the day before so that you have a chance to take a look and see what's coming for you because language facilitation is no joke. It's work. OK, you can't make these kinds of changes. You can't start to like you can't help your child start to like something that they really don't like. You can't help them do that unless you make changes, because right now, the reason that most families are in the circumstance, the current circumstances, which is what your language facilitation plan says, Claire, is, you know, this is what's going on right now. I can look at a video and answer some questions from you and have a real conversation in our strategy session. You know, that's where it all starts really is to just figure out what it is that is causing this kind of um, this kind of resistance 
to using words. And when you can understand where the resistance is coming from, that's how you get rid of it. And when you get rid of resistance, that makes everything happy. That makes everything fun. And that's why, that's why this works is because, you know, it's great. And Christine says, this use of intuition is what makes Marcy so unique to work with. <laughs> Thank you. And you don't get that with all clinical experts. And that is true. And I think, you know, if you have been working with a clinical therapist, if you've been working with a therapist who is the best in their field, you know, I have a mom who I'm just talking to, um, I just met her yesterday through my Facebook interactions and she has used biomedical work and she has worked with what she says is the best apraxia therapist on the planet. And that's amazing because even the best clinical people, but see what happened was then she did biomedical intervention and her child started saying sentences in three weeks, even though she was working with this amazing therapist. And so now what's really great is that her son is able to do the kinds of interaction now that his body is healing and he's detoxing and his brain's able to think again. You know, she's got him working with this amazing therapist who is getting his skills, boom, 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 boom. Like he's making progress so fast. So the combination of the, the biomedical and the, and the amazing clinical skill that this therapist has, has been the ticket. For that child and for me for the language facilitation parents the ones who are ready like I said some of the families who I talk to on strategy sessions they don't sign up for the program because they're not ready um, I've sent parents to go to ENTs and get your stuff taken care of or other parents who have um, issues that aren't are feeding or oral motor real structural kinds of things that need hands-on work from a therapist that can do that and if your child does have have true apraxia, neurological apraxia, or they're having consistent seizures where they're gaining skills and losing skills, and they have a lot of other motorical issues that are going on, or there are cognitive factors that are coming into play. Those kinds of kids do need super, super skilled interventionists to be able to help problem solve all the ups and downs that go with their physical body issues and those things are challenging for parents to do on their own and that's why the folks that I put into the the waves of communication program all have kind of resolved those things first because you can't possibly coach your child into using better because that's what you're doing. I'm coaching you in how to coach your child and facilitate their language and get them doing it all day every day by using these strategies. And when you do that, that that's when you are able to, you know, bring it in and get it done. So I really appreciate that, Christine. And I know that, you know, in Christine's case, you know, I'm going to go ahead and call her out. She was previously working in the system too, where she worked for a nonprofit doing evaluations where she was talking about autism diagnosis for families in order to have them go to intervention like ABA, which is play-based or intervention-based. And these kids had unresolved medical issues, biomedical issues. And Christine said, wait a minute, hold the phone. Stop that other therapy right now. Let's move into doing something that's more appropriate to get the underlying root causes for the communication issue. And in many cases, the kids did start talking and doing other things, all kinds of other things that they previously lost as a result of some toxicity or illness. I mean, I have kids who were, you know, it's uh, amazing the number of different reasons that kids are late talking. So, um, all right. So I've been at this for just about 40 minutes now, and I've talked to you a lot about this Q&A today, and I've had some friends pop on and some good language facilitator parents who are joining me. I'm so glad, once again, to be able to come to you, and I'm getting really excited to go and do my next Q&A with my Spanish-speaking folks who live in Peru, once again getting to another hemisphere, another continent, um, to be able to do some language facilitation today, which is what tickles me the most, is be able to reach out to as many people as I can and let them know that you know this is an available option for you that you don't have to you don't have to rely 
rely on a therapist to fix your kid, to fix their speech. This is something that you ap absolutely can do. And if it's in the case of a child who is recovering from some kind of illness or injury or you know ear infections toxicity um, whatever it is a uh, head injury whatever it is um, you know as they're recovering from those things it's most important that you start from the ground up with language facilitation and that you make it easy and you don't force the issue because the more you force it the more they resist and then you do this and you fall in this downward cycle and you and you're not working on language because you're too busy trying to problem solve these other things and when you don't have to solve problems anymore because language becomes easy happy safe and fun then you can get it done if you are watching this replay and you're interested in getting some information about my ways of communication program and how to work with me you can reach out to me with a private message here or the best way is to view my free class for parents and that's at my website wavesofcommunication.com so until next week go ahead and um, you know reach out I'll be I'll be back on live doing other things because I just love it so much talking to people and um, for those of you who speak Spanish or know someone who speaks Spanish I'll be posting that recording of that live Q&A here on my page too for because I know that I'm reaching families who speak Spanish in other countries too so thanks for joining me everybody Mwah! you're all wonderful and I'll see you next week for live Q&A